comes, he will abide with you forever. It's going to be an ongoing thing. And not like it was in the Old Testament where he came to some for a time, for a specific ministry or a specific uh, uh, period, but rather he would come on them to stay with them. And so we get the promise. He says there in verse number 17, he dwells with you, but things are going to be different. He shall be in you. Things were going to change. The Holy Spirit who was now with them would soon dwell in them. And so we get to a new era where God, by His Holy Spirit, dwells in the New Testament Christian. He would say that uh, further on in verse number 23. Jesus said of those who love Him, the saved, my Father will love Him and we will come to Him. Who is we? But God, the triune God, will come and presence themselves with the believer. And we will make our abode with him. So we get, when we're saved, the Father, the, Han, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, I got my hand down there. Um, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, who come and make their abode with us by the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. And of course, this very clearly demonstrates who the Holy Spirit is. He is God. Things would change. He had not yet been the center of attention, if you like, but would soon become that. And so... We'll uh, have a look at that in just a moment. Why don't we begin with prayer? Father, we are thankful that we can begin this study on the Holy Spirit. We pray you'd give us understanding of who he is and of the ministry he has. And Lord, that we might understand the workings of God in our lives, even now. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Whereas we've taken uh, perhaps two weeks on each of the other uh, doctrinal studies we've done we might take a little bit longer with the study of the Holy Spirit three or four weeks at least I would expect uh, before we get through these things we will have to do in some parts very quick move through like as we look at his names or titles uh, we will do that let's uh, let's note then as we begin different stages of history in the Old Testament, we recognise, and this is uh, a fill-in for you, the age of the Holy. Uh, sorry, the age of the Father. The age of the Father. In the Old Testament, we read of God. Uh, we do see the Son, but we see Him only in glimpses, don't we? We do see the Spirit, but again, He's not the emphasised. Uh, person of the Trinity in the Old Testament. We would see the emphasis there on. God, as in God the Father. Uh, yes, we, we learned several weeks ago that as God expresses who he is, uh, even his very name testifies to it being a plural within a singular expression. And so the very name of God identifies his plurality, not a plurality of gods, but a, but a uh, distinction within the Godhead of a triune God. In the Old Testament, then, the, the emphasis was on God the Father. But in the Gospels, where would the emphasis be? That's all about Jesus, isn't it? And so that's the age of the Son. The age of the Son. If we take a, uh, a look at the Gospels from beginning to end, we're, we're going to see the emphasis of the Lord Jesus. That doesn't mean we don't see God the Father there. We do. It doesn't mean we don't see God the Spirit there. We do. But the emphasis is clearly on the life and times of Jesus Christ. And then we get, uh, after the Gospels, we get into a new period, starting with Pentecost. In the book of Acts, we read the Acts of the Apostles, as some would express it, by, by the ministry and working of the Holy Spirit. This, this is the beginning of an era uh, which we might call the age of the Holy Spirit. 
that will continue through to the rapture of the church. Remember, Jesus told the church, tarry at Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Just like he's just told them here in John chapter 14, he dwells with you, but he shall be in you. The Holy Spirit of God would come and would uh, indwell believers. And so today, if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you are none of his. Wait till you've got the Spirit, and then you'll have the power of God upon you to be able to go and do the work of God. So Jesus would say in John chapter 16 and verse 7, it is expedient for you that I go away. It's, it's an absolute necessity that I leave because if I don't leave, he can't come. When I leave, I will send him to you and, and the Holy Spirit of God would come. God with us. We've got a new form, haven't we? Uh, he has been God with us in the person of Emmanuel, the Lord Jesus. Now it's God with us, the Holy Spirit of God who has come to minister to us. The era in which we live is the era of the Holy Spirit. The church is all about Christ. Our endeavor is to exalt him. But the power with which we do that is the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Our walk with God will be based upon the Holy Spirit. Let's look quickly at some of the names of the Holy Spirit. We'll just give you these quickly and, and pass through. So you're going to start little fires, spot fires on your pages there as we go through. Um, the Holy Spirit is not as much given a formal title such as the Lord Jesus Christ, but many descriptive titles which tell us a lot about his person and work. We see, firstly, he is called Spirit. And that's very obvious, isn't it? Because that is his makeup. He never had a body as the Lord Jesus was. He was a spirit. But secondly, there uh, we note that he is called the Holy Spirit, which puts the emphasis clearly on the nature that he has. That is holiness. His nature is that of holiness. He's called the Spirit of God, which identifies who this is. This is a person of the Godhead. He is, uh, he is there uh, as God coming to dwell with us and he's called the spirit of Christ because as Jesus just sent to, uh, said to us he would send uh, the spirit to us so he's sent by Christ into the world and uh, and so um, he is recognized as the spirit of Christ some of the titles of the spirit reveal his relationship to other persons of the Godhead and so we see in Genesis 1-2 the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Herein we see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in the act of creation, don't we? We'll get to that afterwards. But uh, each of them having their part to play there. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord, he's called in Judges. Uh, he's uh, recognized as his Spirit, identifying him with the Spirit of God. D, the spirit of the living God. He's also called the spirit of your father. Or as God calls him in Genesis chapter 6, my spirit shall not always strive with man. My spirit. God speaking uh, there concerning the needs of the world in the times of Noah. All of this emphasizes his connection with the Godhead. He's called the spirit of Christ or H, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, each of those identifying the Holy Spirit as uh, a part of the Trinity. Some of his titles emphasize uh, not just who he is, but uh, his attributes. We see in Hebrews 9.14, he's called the Eternal Spirit. And who is eternal but God? Uh, again, it emphasizes his deity, but uh, reminds us of that attribute of being eternal. In Revelation chapter 1, we read of the seven spirits of God. That's an interesting concept because we go, hang on a minute. What, how many were there again? Um, seven. Well, the concept of seven as uh, emphasized in the book of uh, Revelation and seen throughout Scripture emphasizes the, the complete or perfection, if you like, of 
the spirit, the, um, the fullness of the spirit. Uh, just let me give you a couple of other references there. Um, Zechariah 3.9 and Zechariah 4.10 and Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6. You can write those down just alongside of that as they uh, deal with uh, some of these things. Let me read you Revelation chapter 5 and verse number 6 there. We read them, And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. Uh, the seven eyes are actually referred to there in Zechariah 3.9 and 4.10 uh, as the reality that God sees everywhere. Here that's identified with Christ because seven being the, the completion of, of his vision, God doesn't miss anything. Um, but it goes on and it says... Um, Seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And, and this speaks about God who sees everywhere and is everywhere present. This is the eternal, the full, the completion of God everywhere. Uh, you can't hide from God. Um, we see in, Reve in Romans 1.4, he's called the spirit of holiness again emphasizing the attribute of holiness. In Isaiah 11 and verse 2, which also gives a sevenfold recognition of the Spirit there in Isaiah 7, uh, uh, 11 and verse 2, he's called the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding. He's also called the Spirit of the Lord there. It goes on, he's called the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Those seven uh, areas emphasizing different uh, uh, realities of the sevenfold spirit of God. In John 14 and verse 17, Jesus calls him the spirit of truth who would come and reveal to us the truths of the scripture and open to us those things uh, because he is the spirit of truth and therefore has the capacity to be able to open the, the truth of the word to us. Some of his titles then reveal his work. Romans 8 and verse 2 calls him the spirit of life, which emphasizes his ministry of regeneration, bringing us to life. That is, we are born of the spirit. The spirit of wisdom, as our 11, 2, and the emphasis of the fact that he is our teacher. The spirit of truth, again, John 14, 17, that he's going to lead us into truth. The spirit of grace, whereby the grace of God becomes a working reality in the lives of the believer. How does that happen? By the Holy Spirit and his ministry in our lives. He's called the spirit of adoption, very uh, much involved in taking lost sinners and bringing them to become a child of God. And then he's called F, the comforter. The comforter, of course, uh, we're probably more familiar with this term, the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, and how he comes to sustain and strengthen us in times of need. <clears throat> Let's consider him uh, for who he is, um, the deity and person of the Holy Spirit. First, firstly, as God. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, of course, uh, we're, we're familiar with the great commission that Jesus gave to go into all the world and preach the gospel, teach all nations, um, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, when we did a study on God, we recognized it's a name singular. By one name, he identifies the three persons. The name, not the names, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, but uh, that association uh, links together the reality of a triune God. Um, again, 2 Corinthians 13 and 14 sees them together in association. But let's turn over to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. 1 John 
chapter 5 and verse number 7. So does the Bible clearly, succinctly put it into words that the Holy Spirit is God? Well, here we read, there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, which is the name of Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Three being one is another way of demonstrating the reality we would know as the Trinity. This emphasizes as clearly as you can put it into words the deity of the Holy Spirit of God. We'll get to Acts chapter 5, but let's turn now to um, John chapter 16. John chapter 16. <clears throat> in verse number 7, Jesus says again as he emphasizes and goes on from chapter 14 where he'd introduced the concept of him sending another comforter where God would dwell with us, where he says we will make our abode with them. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, verse 7, it, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, we're going to look at those uh, in just a minute in his work. But uh, here he is referred to in a very personal way. Uh, he, as God, will come and dwell with us. Uh, but we notice there the emphasis of the word he and him. When he is come, he will reprove. Uh, he is identified as a person here. And uh, he continues to emphasize that verse number 14, uh, or verse number 13, rather, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, for whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. Uh, this identifies that he's not just a, uh, a power, not just a, uh, a concept. He is, in fact, a person. Uh, the same word, it says in our notes here, is used of Christ in several places. Although the neuter term, which is the term that we would use, it, is referred to, uh, it is used to refer to the Holy Spirit at times as well. So he is uh, primarily seen as a he or a him in the masculine sense, um, as we recognize him as a person with the use of personal pronouns. In Acts chapter 5, most of you would be familiar with the story there. And uh, Vernon, would you read for us, please, in uh, verse number 3, Acts 5 and verse number 3. And would you read verse 4 as well, please? We notice a couple of things there. It notes in, in our second point here, uh, the personhood of the Holy Spirit is emphasized in that he can be lied to. In verse number three, Peter said, why did you do this, Ananias? You've lied to the Holy Ghost. Now, you don't lie to the, uh, the power source. You don't, don't lie to your electricity. You don't lie to a force. You lie to a person. And uh, Ananias clearly was lying to the Holy Spirit, and he is a person. But then he, uh, Peter turns around and he says, you've not lied to men, you've lied to God. And in this, he's not just recognized as a person, but more, more specifically is recognized as the person of God. This is God. And so we see there his personhood, but we also see his deity in he, his uh, equivalence there with God. In Romans 8, 27, we read of the mind of, 
of the Spirit and uh, emphasizing the mental capacity. Remember the elements of personhood are your mind, your emotions, and your will, the makeup of the soul, as it were. And he demonstrates that he is a person uh, by the exercise of the mind there. We also see in Ephesians 4.30, we remember the scripture says, Be not, uh, sorry, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Uh, you don't grieve things. You don't grieve the power source. You grieve a person. And the Holy Spirit as a person, demonstrating his personality, is one that can be grieved. When we sin against God, God in his spirit is grieved. And um, it emphasizes his personhood. All right, let's move on to his divine attributes. Essentially, what we want to do in this is to understand that the Bible, as it gives reference to different details about the Holy Spirit, is actually referring to one who is God. And so therefore, we're seeing many attributes, which are attributes which we can't have, or somebody else can't have, only God has. And so we start with the fact, Hebrews 9, 14, He is eternal. The fact that he is eternal identifies him with God. He is the eternal God. And you're going to see every person of the Godhead uh, involved in our salvation. And you're going to see them identified as eternal. We see, uh, secondly, 1 Peter 3.18, him as being omnipotent. Omnipotent. First Peter three eighteen. Phil, do you want to read that one for us, please? Quickened or resurrected, raised by the Spirit. Now, there's a couple of things that are worth considering when we, we look at this. If you look at the resurrection broadly, the Bible tells us that Christ uh, was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit of God, we see in this passage. It also tells us that he was raised by the power of God. Uh, and it also tells us that he raised himself from the dead. We see all three persons of the Trinity... Uh, involved in this act of resurrection. But secondly, we see the reality of uh, him, the spirit, uh, fulfilling the act of resurrection. That's an act of God demonstrating an omnipotence. If I die, uh, I'll call on you, Don, would you come and just raise me to life again? No, that's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Because you're a man. Only God can raise the dead. And uh, that was a demonstration of the reality of who he is. C emphasizes that he is omnis, uh, omnipresent. Omnipresent. Psalm 139, as it goes through those number of verses from, from verse 7. Whither shall I flee from thy spirit? Where am I going to hide from the Spirit of God. God is everywhere present. If I go into the heaven or into hell, if I go into the sea or into the earth, wherever I go, God is there. God's Spirit is there. You cannot hide from the Spirit of God. And uh, we see Him as the omnipresent one. Uh, hence also we touched on earlier the eyes of the Lord being in every place, the sevenfold Spirit of God with those seven eyes that are, that are uh, everywhere uh, present throughout the world and everywhere else. He is omnipresent. I think we emphasized last week or the week before, even the devil is not omnipresent. The devil is limited to time space. Uh, he lives in one point, uh, in one place at one time. Uh, but God is eternal and God is everywhere present. 
The devil walks up and down in the earth, seeking whom he may devour. Uh, but, but the Holy Spirit of God is the omnipresent, everywhere present uh, God um, who is everywhere at one time, at the same time. D, omniscience, omniscience. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 10 and 11 emphasize the fact that the Spirit searches all things. He knows everything. You can't hide anything from him because he knows. Interesting, Jesus said he knew all things. We read of God the Father that he knows all things. But this omniscience is uh, seen also in the Holy Spirit of God. And he knows what's going on. You can hide those things from somebody else. But the Spirit, well, he searches out the deep things, knows what's going on inside you. He is omniscient. E, the emphasis of love. Love in its truest sense. God being the source of love. We read in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's the very beginning of God. Uh, and now we get to some things which are more characteristics. Uh, Romans 5, just on that note, hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed in our hearts by the Holy Spirit or by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And it's an interesting concept that the love is the love of God, but it's the Holy Spirit of God that enables that love to be a reality in us. When the believer is spirit-filled, he has the love of God. Again, that emphasizes not just the, that the Spirit is love, but it emphasizes that the Spirit is God. John 16, 13 emphasizes that the Spirit is truth. Truth, and uh, the God who cannot lie is the one who gave them to us and G holiness again the emphasis of the spirit of God is that of holiness we see uh, this on number two there because he deals with the sin nature as he touches on the needs of men to bring us to God We see those distinctions there. One of the things I love in the scriptures is how it, uh, it just seeps through into the entirety of the scriptures. I, lo I love the parables of Christ and specifically Luke chapter 15 as we look at the different persons of the Trinity. In Luke chapter 15 you see three parables that Jesus spoke. We see the parable of the lost sheep, where the good shepherd came to seek for the sheep. We see the parable of the lost coin, where the woman went to seek for uh, the lost coin. Uh, we see the parable of the lost son, where the father waited for his son to come to repentance and come to them. And as I view these things, I remember the Bible says he told a parable to them. Not three parables, he told one parable. It had three stories in it. It was a triune parable, a trinity, because it testified of a triune God, where the good shepherd represented the Lord Jesus who, come, who came to seek and to save the lost where the woman represented the ministry of the Holy Spirit who came seeking for the lost one and who turned the lights on, lit the candle, uh, swept the floor to deal with the issues so that it would be exposed. And the father who waited for the sinful one to come in repentance to it. We see there a triune God reaching out to man to bring them to, the, to himself. Let's look then at uh, the divine works of the Holy Spirit, the divine works of the Spirit. We already noted in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 2, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. This is God's part, God the Holy Spirit's part, in the work of creation. 
Uh, he was uh, party to the work of God in creation. Our emphasis as we go through this section is to see God at work in the works of the Holy Spirit. For you who believe the Trinity, it's not hard, it's expected. Uh, we sometimes don't even see it because it's just so normal. For those who are not certain of who the Spirit is or the, of the reality of the Trinity, these things should challenge their thinking. Uh, they should uh, give them a bit of a wake-up call to consider who uh, it is that is doing these things as they see the Spirit doing works which are very clearly and obviously the works of God. So the work of creation being ascribed to the Spirit should, should uh, send a shudder through somebody who doesn't believe in the triune God. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3 deals with striving as God again says my spirit shall not always strive with man. This is clearly God talking but he's speaking about the ministry that he has by his spirit in lives of uh, sinful men. Here we have striving with men concerning their sin and rebellion. We mentioned the triune parable where the woman who lost her coin lit the, uh, the candle so that things could be seen. And that's a, a work of the Spirit of God as he illumines the Word of God and brings it to understanding in lives. You know what he's doing? He's exposing the need of salvation to lost sinners. That's the work of the Holy Spirit of God as he strives with men. And then, then the woman gets the, the broom and does her sweeping and, and he's touching on the need of sin and the rebellious hearts of sinful men in bringing them to Christ. That's the work of the Spirit of God. Their failure to heed it brought the judgment of the flood. And of course, Genesis chapter 6, we go on and we see God said, Noah, it's time for you to build the ark. This is all going to happen now. Man will not respond to the appeal of my spirit to them. In C, we, we look at the reality of inspiration. Uh, Don, do you want to read for us, please, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21? 2 Peter 1 <clears throat> and verse number 21. I know you've got your pen in your hand, but uh, we'll open your Bible and get that there. Okay, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And he's talking about the scriptures, if you get it in its context there. Uh, how do we get our Bibles? Uh, God's Holy Spirit moved in the lives of those apostles and uh, their uh, near friends as they uh, wrote the scriptures. And so we get to the scripture we're familiar with. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. How specifically? God's Holy Spirit moved in the lives of those people to bring about inspiration, to enable inspiration. That's a work of God. It was God's word. It was God that inspired, but the Holy Spirit of God is indeed God. We see that just through the concept of inspiration. D, incarnation and the conception of Christ. Incarnation being God taking on human form. In Luke 1 and verse 35, we read the angel answered and said to her, that is to Mary. Remember Mary is um, forewarned of what, what will take place. The angel said to her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee 
Therefore also that holy thing which, is, which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. The Holy Ghost will come upon you. Therefore he will be called the Son of God. It's interesting that this work which would produce one who was the Son of God was the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of incarnation was the work of the Holy Spirit of God. His humanity came through the seed of women, that is, physically, he was born as a man, and yet his deity was eternal. Christ was the pre-existent one, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. But the Holy Spirit of God was involved there in the conception of Christ. E. We look at reproving. We read of John chapter 16 of the Holy Spirit that when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Reproving, this is his ministry to the world at large. Uh, God, the Holy Spirit, appealing to men to bring them back to himself this is, number two, the convicting work of God the Holy Spirit in the heart of the sinner. I think of this uh, every time I look at that Luke 15 picture of the woman sweeping the floor to find that lost coin. You know what she's doing? She's dealing with the dirt. And this is what the Holy Spirit of God does in the lives of sinners. He reproves them, convicts them. This is what happened to Saul on the road to, um, where is he going? Damascus. Um, when, the, when God revealed himself and brought conviction in his life and said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks because God was challenging him. How was he doing that? The Holy Spirit of God was reproving him. Of three things, of sin, and he goes on and explains those in John 16, because they believe not in me. That is specifically rejection of Christ. That's the only sin that's going to stick at the end of the day. That's the sin which is going to sink the ship, if you like. That's, that's the sin which is relevant because if they received Christ, all sin would be dealt with. But of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, here we see Christ evidenced by his ascension. Uh, Jesus is the rule of thumb, if you like. He is the measuring stick. He said, because I go to my Father. The uh, Spirit of God takes us and he addresses our sin, but then he says, look at, look at the comparable. Look at the one who is the standard. Christ is, uh, is the perfect standard, and we've missed it. Um, and then judgment, because the prince of this world is judged, it says there in John chapter 16. So Satan is judged, therefore all belonging to his kingdom will be judged. God's not going to miss anybody. The prince of this world is judged. Judgment is on its way. God deals with sin and God deals with sinners, therefore watch out, he's coming for you. That's, that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God in the heart of a lost people person. Uh, I remember the day I got saved. I remember the conviction that I had where God's Holy Spirit just pressed right into me the reality of my sin and uh, the emphasis that I'm going to die in my sin, be, a lost, uh, be lost forever, uh, be judged of God and God's reproving brought me to salvation. If we have restraining, restraining. Phil, do you want to read for us there Second Thessalonians chapter 2, please? Verses 6 to 8. Second Thessalonians 2 and verses 6 to 8.
so destroy with the brightness of his coming. The context there speaks of the coming of Antichrist and the tribulation period. But he says, well, Antichrist can't come. You don't need to fear if you're saved. You don't need to fear going into the tribulation period because there's something that cannot, uh, that uh, is stopping him from coming. He cannot come while the Holy Spirit of God is still here. He who now letteth will let. He who now hinders will hinder. Because the Holy Spirit has his ministry here and he's dwelling in you and he will abide with you and he continues to do that throughout the time uh, of the church age up until the period of, of the rapture of the church when we're caught up to be with the Lord and he is taken up to be with him. Until that time, the Antichrist can't come. The devil can't take over, can't uh, have his way. So there is a restraining work of the Holy Spirit of God in the world today. He does that through believers and he does that through his ministry in the world today. The restrainer will be removed at the, the time that the saved are taken from the earth in the rapture. Because I am sealed with the Spirit. When I go up, he goes up too. When he goes up, I go up too. It's it, we're going together. Um, we're stuck together. But through his ministry through this period, the works of the devil are restrained. The coming of Antichrist is restrained. Then we get G, regeneration. Or literally, generated again. We think of the concept of being born again by the Spirit of God. In Titus 3.5, uh, it's not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration. When God cleansed us and made us anew and renewing of the Holy Spirit of God within us. God gave us his Holy Spirit as he did that work of regeneration. Number two, we see the truth of that as Jesus speaks with Nicodemus and speaks of being born of the Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. You had a physical birth, then there is a spiritual birth whereby the Holy Spirit of God brings you to life. It's interesting, isn't it? Isn't it God that gives life? Or is Jesus life? Or is it the Holy Spirit of God that gives life? Or do we understand here that we have a triune God in which the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are life givers, the very source of life. So we get to number three, the concept of the new man. We have a new nature, which is called a new creature in the Scriptures. It's the work of the Holy Spirit of God to bring that to life in us. H is the work of illumination. Illumination. Illumination is the work of the Holy Spirit whereby as we read, we come to understand. It's the light bulb moment, if you like, where the Holy Spirit of God goes, let me explain that to you. And you might have read it once or twice or, or 200 times and not really got the, the full sense of that but then he just turns the lights on I believe he does that to those who seek him remember Jesus said if you seek me with all your heart you'll find me but he just uh, opens that up again that reminds us of that parable of the woman who lit the candle so that light could be seen and uh, exposing the sin of the lost man, but exposing also the way of salvation as he brings us illumination. I, we see comforting. Literally there, one who comes alongside to help. Parakaleo, the parallel one who comes beside uh, the believer and comes to help us. And he is the source of strength in our lives. <clears throat> J, we see anointing. 
anointing. In the Old Testament, we have the truths of the anointing, that the priest was to be anointed or the king was to be anointed and they would pour oil on them. We're going to have a look at that a little bit further uh, next week as we look at some of the pictures there regarding him. But um, literally this means to smear upon, to smear upon. So you've already jumped ahead, haven't you? You've already got all the answers. I'm really superfluous. But... Um, People were anointed with oil as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. When the priest would begin his ministry, first the blood was applied, which, which demonstrated the work of the, uh, the blood of Christ necessary in a life. And then the oil was applied. And that was the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God in a life to enable and use us. In 1 John chapter 2, John emphasizes to the believer, he said, you have the anointing. That is, you have the Holy Spirit of God. He didn't say go looking for it. He said, you've already got it. The Holy Spirit of God who seals you, who dwells in you, who makes his abode with you. This is the one who enables you. He has anointed you because we are already indwelled by the Holy Spirit. So this there refers to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, again, Christ said to have had the power of the Holy Spirit because he was anointed to the task at hand. We also get the word uh, baptism used, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a lot of people today who are looking for a baptism with the Holy Spirit Jesus said that the disciples would be baptized with the Holy Ghost. But that was already fulfilled. It was never something that they were commanded to seek. It was something that they were told would happen. Uh, the uh, placing into uh, God, as it were, is a, is a work by God's Holy Spirit. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, we read of the believer being placed into the body by the Holy Spirit. That's the baptism uh, into position uh, and place for growth and ministry and God's purposing there. This is a work that God does without being sought. This is a work that occurs when somebody gets saved, when a lost person gets saved. He doesn't have to ask for adoption. It's immediate. God's Spirit takes him and uh, puts him into the family of God. He doesn't have to ask for new life and regeneration. God's Spirit brings him to life. He doesn't have to ask for baptism. He is sealed with that Holy Spirit of God, whereby uh, he may um, um, have the ministry of God in his life. Verse 6, uh, or rather number 6 in our... Uh, notes there, are, there is no command to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You're not going to find it. We shouldn't be looking for it. We should be uh, moving on from that. We note then the distinction between the baptism with the Spirit and the filling with the Spirit. We're never commanded to be baptized with the Spirit. That's a reality that God does in our lives. We are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. And that is for me to allow God's Holy Spirit to, uh, as it were, to overflow my life, to control me. That, that's the command to submit myself to God, that He, by His Spirit, might fulfill His purpose in my life. L, sealing. Not the sealing of up there, but S-E-A-L, sealing, as we seal an envelope. And the concept there is, is that exactly. We remember when Christ died, the tomb was sealed. Uh, that is, they put their stamp of, uh, of security upon that. And nobody can break that seal without defying the authority that it represents. When Christ sent his Holy Spirit to seal us, this is the seal of God on the life of a believer. Remember Jesus said, 
we're in his hand, we're secure. And we're in the Father's hand, we're secure. You want to you break that? More than that, he, it's like he pours his wax on and puts his stamp there, and that's the Holy Spirit of God, the seal of God on us. Nobody can take me away uh, from him. Nobody can remove from me the salvation of God. Ephesians 4.30 emphasizes that reality. Whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Every Christian is sealed by the Holy Spirit. Every Christian is sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. It's not something you seek. This is a reality of what occurs the day a person gets saved. The ministry of the Holy Spirit moves from just the, uh, the conviction. He moves into the active working of God whereby we are sealed unto the day of redemption. That is, till the day we're called up to be with him, uh, we have the very seal of God upon us. And that emphasi <coughs> emphasizes eternal security. Can't lose that. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit of, is given you to seal you, to secure you, and you can't lose that even if you try. Uh, that is God's stamp on your life. And we see the work of intercession in Romans chapter 8 uh, that uh, he speaks on our behalf with groanings which cannot be uttered as it were. There are times that we pray. There are times we don't know what to pray. And we just yearn for the working of God. And it's like the Holy Spirit of God speaks on our behalf. He takes over and this is, this is what he really means. Uh, this is what he really needs. Uh, this is the working of God uh, to bring our needs and desires before the throne room of heaven. The intercession of the Spirit. We see also of the Lord Jesus interceding on behalf of the believer. N is the work of sanctification. Sanctification. The word sanctify means to set apart. Uh, when God saves a sinner, he is taken as separate from the world uh, and made distinct. He is made to be one of the people of God. Uh, already we noticed that he's made alive. Uh, he is legally made to be a son of God. He's sealed with the Spirit. Uh, he is uh, anointed. Uh, he, is, uh, um, he is made to be a child of God. But God then begins the work of sanctification, uh, or literally made holy. So we need to understand two aspects of sanctification. And if you're doing quizzes, you'll need to remember this for the quiz as well. But two aspects of sanctification. In fact, this is important for us to understand because this, this impacts, a, as we look at Scripture, some of the, some of the truths there and, and how we respond to them. Sometimes God speaks like this work of sanctification is done and dusted. It's already finished. Sometimes he speaks like it's something that is uh, ongoing in our lives. And that's because there are different aspects that we see of that. Uh, firstly, we see the positionally, uh, positionally, the moment we are saved, God's Spirit sets us apart. We are sanctified. It's, uh, it's almost like in the eyes of God, you're a finished product. He can see you sitting on the shelf, a completed work. Um, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, as it were. We're, uh, we're already done and dusted. But as you and I see it, that's not quite the truth, is it? We, we're not a finished product. In fact, we've still got a lot of rough edges need to be worked over. We are, it says in our notes, made holy and acceptable to God by the sac sacrifice of Christ. We are set apart. We are different. That's 
my position in Christ, separated, sanctified. But in a practical sense, we have the ongoing work of God to bring the reality of that into our lives. And so as much as I am separate from the world, I am holy as opposed to a world that is unholy. I'm holy because I'm forgiven. Yet the holiness of God needs to be worked into my life. So work out your own salvation. Scripture says, let that work come into our lives. That's the ongoing and daily work of the Holy Spirit of God in the life of the believer, is to make manifest the reality of what Christ has accomplished. Uh, Christ has done the work to, to accomplish this. The Holy Spirit of God has set me apart. Now let's see that. And then God's Holy Spirit gives you a work over. Sometimes he needs to, needs to put you through the ringer so that you start listening again, so that you start allowing him to fulfill his work uh, in you, uh, to allow him to sanctify you. And uh, uh, so he works. Positional and practical sanctification, different aspects whereby the believer stands. One, uh, his legal standing before God. One, his practical standing before God. And uh, we need to understand the distinction of those things uh, in our lives. All right, I think that's enough for us to chew on for tonight. And um, aren't you thankful that God has given us his Holy Spirit to work in us? to dwell in us, to make his abode with us, to abide with us. And by his working, we can be made more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's God's endeavor for us. Well, I'm thankful for that and thankful that God, by his spirit, is fulfilling that work in me. Let's pray. Our Father, we are thankful tonight for the Holy Spirit of God. Of